I'm going to make things simple. Everything I'm talking about today is available on utahbio.com under the Getting Started article. Everything. Also, I have tutorial videos there as well. Once you get there, it's on the left-hand side. So you want to go to the Getting Started article. And also the tutorial videos. If any of you have seen the YouTube stuff, I'm doing similar stuff to that today. For all the organic chemistry majors in the room, I apologize. I'm probably going to murder some of the chemical terms and such, but I'm going to go over some basic chemistry and dumb it down. Um, I'm, I'm not a chemistry major. I never was. I just kind of learned biodiesel, and we're going to start. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Graydon Blair. Um, I'm one of the organizers of this conference, but I also run Utah Biodiesel Supply. I'm sure a lot of you have little trinkets in your house from my shed. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about two, three things today. First, we're going to talk about making biodiesel, making a small batch. I'm going to talk about some of the basic chemistry. We're actually going to demonstrate a batch, but they're going to teach you how to do a titration, a real titration using a titration kit. And then we're going to make a batch of biodiesel from waste oil. And hopefully by the end of today, we'll have this batch sitting over here separated so that you can see it. Okay? Um, a little bit about basic chemistry. That's a little bit too big for me. We're dealing with an oil. All organic oils in nature are something called triglycerides. If you look on the back of your candy bars, that's a nice way that they hide that. Because we really shouldn't be taking all those nasty oils in our body. But a triglyceride is nothing more than a blob of glycerin and three fatty acid chains hanging off of it. Okay? This is what we call a tri. Also, if I have a glycerin and two of the fatty acid chains are hooked and one of them, whoops, has fallen off, I call that a diglyceride. If I have one or two of them fallen off, I have a monoglyceride. <coughs> Okay? So again, these are fatty acid chains. <coughs> Our goal in making biodiesel is to take, take an organic oil and to understand what kind of form it's in. There's actually a lot of molecules that are all packed together tight and within there, so I might have a bunch of triglycerides and monoglycerides and diglycerides, and I could even have some free glycerin hanging out in there too. In nature, as things occur naturally, they start to break down. A little bit of heat, a little bit of water with some oil sitting outside, and we're going to start getting dyes and monos breaking off because these chains naturally will break off. Okay? To get biodiesel, all we do is just a basic chemical reaction. It's called transesterification, or if you're using sulfuric esterification, you take oil, you add an alcohol. I'm choosing to use methanol today. And you use a catalyst, and you can either use lye, which is NaOH, its proper name is potassium or sodium hydroxide, or caustic potash. I can't spell it. Caustic potash, which is KOH, as my catalyst. And then I'm going to add two other things to this mixture heat plus mixing. On the other side, what I'm going to get, hopefully, if everything goes well, is biodiesel, some glycerin, and always a little bit of soap. There's not much we really can do about that because no matter how hard we try, even in naturally occurring brand spanking new oils, there's still a couple of these triglycerides and triglycerides hanging out. So there's a little bit of soap. We're also going to get a little bit of water. Okay. Your goal is to get as much of this as possible. This we really can't control because it's just going to happen, but as little of this as possible and a little of this as possible. There's also a side reaction that goes on when we make biodiesel. <coughs> oil plus water, there's always a little bit of water in our oil. We try and eliminate it as much as possible. If you come to the class tomorrow where we talk about testing techniques, we'll talk about how to remove some of that water or how to test for it. 
but oil plus water plus a catalyst equals what? Soap. Soap. We don't like soap. We want biodiesel, right? Okay. Free fatty acids, which we get as they break off like this, plus lye, which is our catalyst, also equals soap. soap. Okay. There's a problem though. This reaction produces a little bit of water on its own. And so as this starts producing some water, this plus some of that lye is going to get soaked. That's why I say there's really no way to never completely eliminate all that soap. So you're always going to get it. Our basic goal today then is going to be to take this oil, and I've got some new oil here today. I'm going to add some methanol, and I'm going to add some catalyst. I like to combine these two together first because this is a solid state. We need to put it into a liquid form. We call this methoxide. I'm going to add some heat. We want to get biodiesel and glycerin. Real quick, we're going to start because I want to see that this happens. I don't know what my temperature is at. Let's talk about the basic recipe for biodiesel. Grab your little flyer here. So the basic recipe on all the internet, you may have seen different things, is basically what's at the top left corner of this. Let's talk about it. So we're going to take one liter of oil. Yes? I, if there are, they're scattered out here. I only made 30 because I didn't have any clue would get this many interest. It's online and it will also, if you um, email me at this site, I will mail it to you, but we'll also be putting it on the site. So, um, one liter of oil, 200 milliliters of methanol. I'm going to play with KOH because it dissolves a little bit quicker in methanol. Uh, so I'm going to use 7 grams. If I was using sodium hydroxide, I'd use 5.5 grams. And then I'm going to make biodiesel with it. So I've got my oil. I've got some catalyst here. This is what the difference between potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide look like. I'm going to pass this around so you can see it. Just don't open it. Huh? No taste testing? I wouldn't taste it, no. <laughs> also, just so you know, everything that we have up here, we really don't want to take back home. I'd like to thank Nebraska BioPro, who's provided all the stuff today. It's for sale. I'd love to get rid of it. And there's stuff out in the trunk. We're going to do a titration kit, so we'd love to get rid of it. So, First thing we're going to do is we're going to dissolve some catalyst into some methanol. To do that, I need to weigh out some sample here. Hello. We're just about to 100 degrees. Cool. Hello. Hello. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things about safety. You need safety gloves. You're closing now. You need some safety goggles. You right need in a the apron. Of the, uh, um, oh, really? Because I didn't get any missed calls. I've been looking at my phone. Okay. Can you, take it Can you grab it outside? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. Appreciate that. We're going to use just a basic scale. This scale is measurable down to 0.01. For biodiesel, for what I'm doing for this basic batch, I don't need to be that accurate, but when we use it for a titration kit, you do. Okay? Okay, let's talk about this basic. Everyone kind of get this gist. We're going to erase this and do the basic recipe here. Where's he So I've got one liter of oil. 200 milliliters of methanol. I'm going to use 7.5 grams catalyst. I'm going to use KOH. Okay? They should have shipped it instead of just sent it to me. <laughs> this will work by the advantage of using potassium over sodium as it dissolves quicker. Yeah, it's going to dissolve a lot quicker. Uh, there's some safety problems. I brought them in. There they are. Okay. In terms of which one is better, oh, I got that. Potassium hydroxide dissolves better. Both of them will make biodiesel. 
one of them just dissolves better. It's, the glycerin is a little bit less, uh, more runny with potassium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide doesn't violet, bo uh, boil as violently in warm temperatures. So if your methanol temperature is above about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, has to dump a bunch of catalyst in it, it really boil. Sodium hydroxide doesn't do that. Well, that's because sodium hydroxide also takes forever to dissolve. If you're, it's kind of a give and take. So I personally like to use potassium hydroxide because it's just easier to work with. So what I've got up here is just a little scale. I've got this teared, which means I've zeroed it out. I'm going to put 7.5 grams. Grams. Oh, beautiful. Well, right to it. Lucky. What do you mean? I know. <laughs> 200 milliliters of methanol. Methanol is nothing more also than heat in the yellow bottle. You can get it at um, racing fuel distributors. You can get it all over the place. Um, a lot of people think, oh, it's the most dangerous substance in the world. Well, better go tell that to all the racers out there. It is a fairly common substance, but you do want to be careful with it. So, all of you pretty much know a lot about the safety, so I'll leave that to another course. We want to make biodiesel today. So, I'm just going to pour this catalyst in here. I'm just going to start mixing it up. We'll let this mix for a minute. Can you mix this? I'm going to use the chemistry up here. You had no reaction because it's pretty cool. Oh, it's reacting. No, maybe it wasn't cool. It, if I was to dump, if it was warm, it would boil. Yeah. And actually, if we're doing this a little bit quick to get it dissolved, but if I was to let it sit here, you'd actually see it bubble up from the bottom. Okay. Let's talk about what's happening here. So I've got this triglyceride. I'm going to do just theoretical. I won't talk about the dyes and the truck and the monos. And along comes my methanol, my catalyst. Okay. I'm going to use my methanol as a block. And I'm going to use my catalyst kind of like scissors, okay? Okay? In real simplistic terms, what happens when we make biodiesel is the catalyst comes in and it snips these chemical bonds. These are fatty acid chains, these are glycerin. And so what happens is you get this glycerin blob out here and these fatty acid chains are broken off and start floating around. Well, the next step is we want to hook the methanol to the fatty acids. So in these come, and our goal is to connect these. The combination of a fatty acid with methanol is something called a fatty acid methyl ester. If we're technical about it, it's called transesterification. You can go out and read about that. This is basic, basic stuff for making biodiesel which also happens to be biodiesel. So our goal is to take this plus this and these. Why? Why do we want to make biodiesel? Because we want to take somewhat of a globby molecule and fit it down. We're not using kerosene or diesel fuel to do that, and that is possible to do it, but that's not biodiesel. This is different. What this is is where we are chemically altering the molecular structure of this oil into something completely different. This is biodiesel. You notice it sloshes around a lot easier than oil. This is rather thick. Well, fuel injection pumps don't like thick oil unless you heat them. Well, the whole goal of making biodiesel is to put a fuel in your vehicle that you don't have to modify the vehicle, at least in the winter time, um, or at least in the summertime. And so we want to chemically alter that. The analogy I use is I'm taking an egg and I'm taking some flour and I'm getting a cake. A lot of people think, well, you make biodiesel and you're going to end up with this oil and you've just diluted it with methanol. I have not. Just as much as an egg is not a cake. It's completely different when we're done. Okay. So what we get on the back end is we're going to get some glycerin and we're going to get these fatty acid chains of methanol. Well, the glycerin molecules are heavier, so they're going to fall. And these are going to stay up top. And so out of this one, two molecules, or things, I've gotten one, two, three, four different things. Much lighter substance, as you saw, it was much less viscous. 
And so what we end up with is biodiesel on top and glycerin on the bottom. We remove the glycerin, we wash it, which we won't go into in this class, and we've got biodiesel that we put in the vehicle, unmodified, and drive on down the road. Okay? That's the basic premise behind biodiesel and the chemistry of it. I want to talk a little bit about the soap and the other things that go on. So, in real life, we don't always have perfect triglycerides. Wish we did, but we don't. When we add some methanol here, this methanol comes in and it sees this and see it's, I compare it to a rose that you've taken out of the water. Let's say that this is the stem of the rose. If you ever take a rose out of water and let it sit around for a day, it kind of cauterizes itself on the bottom. If you talk to any florist, they say if you want to keep that rose growing, you snip the bottom and you put it back in water so it can start drying the water again. Well, in very simplistic terms, that's what's going on if we wanted to turn that back into water. <coughs> Problem, we've got this catalyst in here, call it here, and it comes in and it's going to react with these to form soap, and these will form biodiesel. Again, soap is not what we want, but unfortunately in nature, oils always have these broken out. Okay? There's a term called esterification using sulfuric acid, whereby I can actually modify that rose stem, recut it off, and allow the methanol to reattach to it. We're ready to go, Brady. We're ready? All right. So it's kind of a, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So this is new oil that we're playing with. We're probably going to get biodiesel and some glycerin and maybe a little bit of water, maybe a little bit of soap. Okay. This, based on our recipe, is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is... About 135. But, oh, did we take it up that hot? Yeah. Okay, good. And all I'm going to do is just, where's the stir? Other side, there you go. This is just a magnetic stir. To make biodiesel, I need nothing more than heat and mixing. This is a heater. It's also a mixer. I can do this on a stove. This is why people can do it in water heaters, in anything. If people say, well, my water heater, my processor is the best. Yeah, right. All I need is something to heat it and something to mix it with. Some just have really expensive ones, some have basic things. I can do it on my stove. I'm going to show you what this looks like here. We're just going to start pouring this in. We're going to get a color change almost immediately. That's methoxide that you're putting in. This is methoxide. Methanol this is, pardon? That's methanol and... Methanol and the AH. catalyst, yep. Yeah, okay, wait, sure. Yep. We'll just start to let that mix up for a while. That's a constant temperature, it's still being heated, right? No, I've turned the heat off. Okay. The oil will hold this temperature right. pretty good. Also, when you add methanol to oil, it produces a little bit of heat on, in and of itself. Actually, when you add the lye to the methanol, it generates heat. If, how many of you have made biodiesel? Okay, we've got a few in the room. You ever felt that jug when you put the uh, biodiesel or the methanol yeah, and such in there? It's it's Pardon? doing in a carboy, you have to kind of bend yep. it because it's going to... Any of you seen a BioPro do it? No. i got to tell you, it really gets hot. <laughs> uh, that's why it's made out of stainless steel, because we dump the chemical in all at once. If any of you saw BioLyle's presentation where he was dumping it in, that side gets hot and it gets hot fast. Look at my color. I've now gone from a really dot light yellow to a dark color. Now you wouldn't want to go higher in the temperature because that starts to boil off the methanol. Yeah. Is that the reason? That is. Methanol so the boils. The not good. Pardon? The higher the higher than 140 is probably. Well, methanol. methanol boils, they tell me, at about 148 degrees Fahrenheit, but it depends on your elevation. We're sitting at a mile high, and so it's going to boil at a little bit less than that because the barometric pressure in this area is lower. So it'll boil right off. But yeah, generally about 130 to 135 is where I like to take it. So we're going to let this just kind of mix for a minute, and while that's doing it, we're going to talk about titrations. That's our next step. Any questions before I continue? I was told by somebody who produces a lot of it that when they add their catalyst to it, they pour it in slowly. Yes. Put it back because it's yep. 
Let's talk a little bit about that. There's a various some different types of processors out there. I bet they have a water heater. What kind? It's one of our network with the guys at Dynamite, and they were, he was telling me that <coughs> so they put you it in slower. Actually, how much they produce, inject into the time? I know what the numbers were, but the basic the basic premise is you want the methoxide to mix thoroughly. You basically want the catalyst to hit all these molecules and really come together. Well, in a water heater, how most of them are doing it is just dumping it in the top, so you don't really get good mixing. And so to overcome that, we pour our methoxide in slowly and we pour it in right at the pump. And so that means we're going to get all the methanol touching all the oil. If you dump it in too quickly, methanol and oil don't like each other. The methanol will sit on top. It'll never mix with the oil down below, and so you really won't get a good reaction. And that can be the same in all sorts of different reactors. So it's spinning. What does that mean? It's spinning. I've got a, just a spinner down on the bottom. I'm just spinning it for my mixing. So causing it spin? I'm causing it to spin with a little thing on the bottom. Yep. I just have a mixer down on the bottom. Notice the color? It's turning to a really nice amber, isn't it? Okay, we'll mix this for a little bit more and then we'll shut it off and it'll move into something else. Do you recommend else. getting those for most of your batches and doing small batches first? Or I do. do you just well, you don't need this kind of a fancy of equipment if you want, but yeah, you do. this is kind of a nice. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend that you understand biodiesel well enough that you can take any oil that you pick up at any restaurant and make a little batch. Because it's a lot better to make a it's nasty a batch of biodiesel in a liter than in a 50 gallon jug and trash the whole batch. And I've, I've trashed a few batches. Do you know that come by that? Like that? You can get it from him. You can get it uh, through a major chemical <laughs> retailer, a store. Most places in your area are going to have a chemistry store because you've got high schools near there. they got to get their stuff from somewhere. And so if you, if you can't find it, you can always hit them up, or you yeah, just look in the yellow pages under price. chemical distributors. So you're eBay, sure, or what? Heater. eBay. College eBay too. Bookstores. College bookstores, yeah. There's a lot of high-class hobby shops around. There's there's three of them in Utah alone that I can get them from. But um, you can get them through me as well. You can get them, you know, yeah, all over the place. So I have a question for you. Uh huh. What's the dangers in the methoxide? Um, when it boils, you say it boils at 148. What kind of danger is involved with that happening? Well, one, methanol fumes aren't good for you, but two, the problem is that there's a certain level of solubility of methanol. Have you ever, anyone ever made syrup on a stove, poured sugar in water, and then made syrup out of the maple leaf? If you ever keep adding more syrup, or a better example is putting salt in water. Salt can only, water can only absorb so much salt, right? Well, methanol can only absorb so much catalyst. If you boil some of that methanol off, that some of that catalyst is going to come out. The other problem that you run is that you might not have enough methanol to fully make the reaction go. And how we figure this out, and it's in that, that document that you have, we basically take however much oil I have, so we'll call it that X, and we times it by 0 0.20. Whatever the result is, is how much methanol I use. Now there's some out there that say 0.22. I, I would tell you that either one works. I just go with 0.20. Part of you have a question? Okay. But the problem is if you're boiling some of that 0.20 off, you may bring it down to like 0.15. And now there's not enough really left to give a good reaction. And that's why you don't want to boil it all. Uh-huh. Isn't there a consideration of a flash point of methanol if you're at a level too hot? Starts fire. I'm sure there is. I've never seen it flash in all the and time I've done to. it. <laughs> and I don't want to either. Yeah. So once it boils like off, it just turns into vapor. And even if it's a closed tank, it's not going to help. If it's a closed pressurized vessel, it'll come back in. But you don't want it in a vapor. You want it in a liquid to make the reaction go. Just how I wanted to turn this into a liquid instead of a solid so it would work. Methanol is not as dangerous as you guys think it is. I mean, we run in the same bunch of rock crawlers, competition. I work with it all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't flash. Like it's we're making the oxide. People are always telling me, watch out for the flash flow. Yeah. I never heard it's, just like, I it's just like it's just like gasoline. It's flammable, but, but it don't push your luck. That's flammable. Or no, <laughs> it's probably less flammable than gasoline, but it you got to respect it. <clears throat> don't be afraid of it, but do respect it. Let's talk about titrations next. Oils. I need to run out and get you a mini, okay. mini stir bar. Alrighty. 
Where's my samples of waste oil? Where's uh, okay, this is WDO? There, yeah. Okay. And I don't know which one is gross, is the heavy duty and which one is not. So <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's when you're doing that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Someone tell me how late this goes to, so I can watch my clock. 2.50. Okay, good. So we got a little bit of time here. Okay, this is mixed for about 10, 15 minutes. So I'm going to turn the stirrer off. The heat is off. We're going to just sit and let that wet kind of sit for a while as we get our titration ready. Okay. Go ahead and flip the page over for those of you that have this, and we're going to talk a little bit about titration. The items needed to do a titration, you need some isopropyl alcohol. I recommend get as pure as you can. This came, I think, from Walmart, probably. Walmart. Walk into Walmart, you can get it super cheap. Um, the red bottle of heat is isopropyl alcohol as well. You need some distilled water. Distilled because we want the pH of the water as pure as we can. We don't want acidic or basic water because it'll throw off our titration. You're going to need some catalyst. I would recommend whatever catalyst you plan on using to make your biodiesel out of, let that also be the catalyst that you do to your titrations with. There are some that say that there are conversion factors, and yeah, there are, but it can kind of get messy. And so just, just use the same catalyst you're going to make your biodiesel out of. You got, you got your catalyst anyway. Uh huh. Is there a benefit to using one over the other? When doing titrations? No, or there's both a. Both for when you're maxing Not really. I, I mean, one does, like I said earlier, one dissolves in methanol better. Had I had sodium hydroxide, we still would have been waiting for that stuff to dissolve. But as you noticed, it dissolved real quick. Isn't sodium hydroxide considerably cheaper? It is considerably cheaper, and you use less. You know why? Because potassium hydroxide is only 90% usually. Okay, that's part of it. Where's my chemist in here? Well, okay. why? it's longer. Okay. Sodium hydroxide you use less of? Yes. You actually want to use less sodium hydroxide than potassium hydroxide? Yes. The molecular weight. Molecular weight. Thank you. We got a, It's the molecular weight. Gotcha. Potassium hydro or sodium hydroxide is a it's a denser yeah it's a denser chemical too. So you use less. You actually use the same volume, but you're using less of that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got potassium hydroxide. We're going to be playing with today. You notice that mine is sealed. And it's sealed on purpose. If I pop this lid open and start breathing on it, I can what's do called carbonate it. While it's not good for me to breathe in either, it'll react with air on contact. If you live in humid environments, it is absolutely important that you keep your methoxide sealed, or your, your catalyst sealed. There's a couple of different things out there you can use to do that with, but one of the things that we choose to do it with is just a five gallon bucket and a lid. You can use a standard lid, but this lid's kind of cool. They call it a gamma lid. I really got that one. This has a seal on the bottom of here, and it has a seal on here. I put this on my bucket. I clamp this down tight. I have a bucket full of methoxide or catalyst I've had for two years, and with a product like this, it still is dry. It's just really important that you keep it dry because immediately on contact, it will start reacting with the moisture in the air. We're in a desert community here, so it's not as bad. But anyone from Louisiana? It's bad there, huh? And it'll get <laughs> really... I, I talked to several people in the deep south when it's humid in the middle of the day. And I mean, they're, they're measuring that stuff out as quick as they can <laughs> because the water is getting into it. And if it does get moisture-laden, and it can be dry. It'll ruin it. No. It's ruined. No. Okay. Yeah. Is there a... Can you use this? In the you can. Humidity? Is there a point in the humidity that's safe for like it goes above a certain level. There probably is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what that would be. I would just say just keep it as dry as you can. Um, what about the liquid KOH? Let's talk a little bit about that. The real quick answer, don't use it if you're doing it for home brewing. It's, it's not potassium hydroxide. It's potassium methylate which means it's made with no water. It's better for biodiesel production. But let's, let's talk a little bit about safety real quick. Yeah. If I get some of this in methanol, uh-huh. I couldn't hear the question. The question was, what about the liquid forms of this? Oh. So you can buy things that are called potassium methylate and sodium methylate. 
They're used in the industry and commercial places to do biodiesel with. I don't recommend them for home brewers, and here's why. If I put some of this on my hand, it begins to burn. I can feel it, and I can feel it almost immediately. That means I can wash it off. Potassium methylate and sodium methylate instantly kill your nerves. You don't even know it's hurting you. It's an incredibly dangerous product to use unless you have the ability to transfer it from the container it's in directly into your processor with no intervention of you moving hoses around. I don't recommend it. So, but it's a wonderful product because it's so dry. So you don't have to worry about moisture. You know, yeah, moisture is not too much of an issue because you just pump it in. The problem is methanol is somewhat hydroscopic though and it will absorb a bit. But, you know, not near as bad as this stuff though. Okay. So let's talk about titrations. How many of you made a volcano in high school or elementary out of baking soda and lemon juice, right? That's all we're doing with titrations. You read out on the internet about how hard it is to do and it confuses you. Have any of you ever been confused by watching titrations? I know I was when I first started. My goal is to hopefully make it dumb enough and easy enough for you to understand. Uh, we have oil. It's a bad marker. So we have some oil here, and as I said, it, it becomes acidic, or we get those free <coughs> fatty acid chains that break off of it as it gets older. Well, how we measure that is by taking a titration. So I've got this oil out here, it's got a couple free fatty acids floating around, so I've got some oil that's got an unknown acid content. In other words, what percent of this oil has free fatty acids floating around here? Well, I have a really handy base, and I know the amount of what purity this is. And I bet if I add base to that acid, and I measure how much base I put in until it neutralizes it, huh, I bet I can figure out how much acid's in there. That is all you're doing when you're doing a titration. You are literally just taking some form of an acid in an oil, and you're measuring in measured amounts of a base that you know what it is, you record it, you watch when it neutralizes it, and then you measure it. And there's a couple formulas that will tell you, okay, this equates to how much acid was in that oil. Why do we want to know that? Well, if you remember, biodiesel plus oops, oil plus methanol plus catalyst equals biodiesel, but uh, free fatty acid plus catalyst equals soap. The problem is that the free fatty acids will attack the catalyst before the oil and the methanol. And so you'll get soap before you'll get biodiesel. So our goal is to figure out how much of these are in there so that we can add enough to make the biodiesel plus more to fully neutralize those acids. That's all we're doing when we're doing a titration. Tell me how acidic it is so I can take my 7.5 which I know is what it takes to make biodiesel and new oil, and then add the amount of base to fully neutralize that, so I still get biodiesel left over. You're going to make some soap, because we're going to ruin those, but that's how it works. So I'm taking just a volcano, taking some, some baking soda, in this case a much stronger base, which is potassium hydroxide, and lemon juice, which is the acid in an oil, and I'm going to add a base to it, and I'm going to figure out how much that is. Here's how it's done. We do something really fancy called making a 0.01% solution of either KOH or NaOH. The chemist, did I get that right in the room? Yep. What's that? I get, it's 0.01 or 0.01%. Yes. 0.01%. One gram, one gram, one gram. What? You, oh yeah, you work in a molar. Okay. But that's all I'm doing is I'm making a really dilute version of this, and I'm going to use a couple formulas to figure out what my acid content is. Okay. So grab your flyer here. Let's learn about this. So I've got everything I need. I've got some catalyst. I've got some cups. <coughs> Pull those out here in a second. And I've got to make this solution because this is my. Um, baking soda, if you will, to make my volcano. Okay? It's 0.1%. 0.1%? No, so mm. 0.01. One gram to one liter, one to one thousand. That's 0.01. I never get it right, because I 
a stinky mouth, they just know how to make it. <laughs> to make it, you take one gram of your catalyst plus one liter water equals your titration solution. Okay? Now remember I can use sodium hydroxide or I can use potassium hydroxide, it really doesn't matter. My goal is just to get some known quantity of stuff to add into here so I can figure out how much of this I'm going to need. Okay, so let's start doing some. I have some pre-measured stuff up here that we'll kind of play with, but we're going to make our own. So I'm going to make a liter of water. By the way, if you get a titration kit, it should have a lot of this stuff in it. Basically what I've got here, this is your list of stuff you'd like to get if you get a titration kit. If you'd like to get one pre-measured or pre-done, we carry them. We've got some outside afterwards you can purchase as well from us. I'm just going to take some water. This is just a vessel that allows me to measure down to one liter. You want to be as accurate as you can with this because we're dealing in such small amounts and such a little bit off at a small amount can be a lot off down the road. It's kind of like I, have, I heard a story of a guy flying an airplane. Um, if you're off by one degree, if you're flying an airplane around the world, you can, when you hit the other side of the world, or come around, you're off by 500 miles. Same basic principle is true with titration, so you want to, you want to be as accurate as you can. Okay, we're going to measure out one gram of titration. It's important that you have a scale that's accurate down to about 0.1 gram or 0.5 grams. The scales that we weigh out our other stuff with, our, our bulk stuff to make biodiesel, really aren't that accurate. But a scale like this works, a balanced scale works. Find something that's accurate down to about 0.1 of a gram. Okay, to do that, I'm going to turn the scale on. I'm going to put this on. Oh, uh, it covers off. There is, yep. And I need to tear this scale. And what that means is I'm weighing the value of this little vessel that I've just put on the scale. Okay? This is the hard part. Yep. So my scale right now is reading at zero. Not very much. One, one gram of KOH is just a few flakes. Point five, point six, eight, nine. I want that big flake in there. Nine, five. Right now. Yeah. One. Okay. And again, you want to be as accurate as you can. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to put it in here. I don't know if you can see this, but moisture is already eating away this catalyst. I had a little tiny drop of it, and it's already turning to water. That's how quick this stuff will go bad if you leave it open in the air. So we're going to let this stir for a minute. Stir it with this thing. Where did that other little stir bar go? The tiny one stretch of a box over here. There it is. We're basically going to mix this up for a minute, okay? And this will become my known amount of basic solution, or my baking soda, if you will. I don't know if any of you can see this, but that thing is already starting to separate. There's kind of a beautiful color on the bottom. It takes a while to separate out, but it's coming out. It's still pretty warm. I don't know if you can use that yeah, or not. Probably it'll dissolve pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay, here's how to do your basic titration. You need about three vessels. You need a vessel that you label titration solution, a vessel that we're going to label alcohol, a 
I like to do this is kind of just my waist. Really small. Um, let me show you an example. These cups are 50 milliliter cups. They're perfect. So about 50 milliliters or less. You're gonna you're gonna do about well we'll talk about 10 milliliters of alcohol, one milliliter of oil, a couple drops of phenol solution, which is a pH indicator, and then start adding your titration solution. So it needs to hold about I'd say at least 30, so you can slosh it around. Those are 100 grade. These ones are? Yeah. Okay. Okay. One important thing, and I don't know that I've got it written down here, is never, ever, ever draw with a with a syringe from your source container. And the reason for that is you don't want to contaminate it. So this titration solution that we've made up, we're going to put in one of these. Yeah. Actually, we could put it in here and slosh this around, huh? Okay. Yeah. I'm pour that in. So I'm going to take this solution here, and we're going to put it in this one liter jar. Whatever come jar you kit. get, you need to label that as poisonous. Our titration kits come with it labeled on the front. This looks an awful lot like water if you've got kids or other people around, and boy, it's a hot day, I'm thirsty, and they take a chug of that. That could be a bad situation really quick. So anytime I ever produce my titration solution, I get a black <coughs> marker out and I write poisonous on it. And I store it somewhere where it's not going to be touched by anyone. Again, if you get ours, it's got a highly corrosive sticker on it, but it's important that you mark that. Does it make a difference if it's after you finish it, should you refrigerate it or does it make a difference? It doesn't really make a difference. I will tell you that after about 90 days, refresh it because even moisture in the air while it's sitting here will make it go bad. So. Okay, so I'm going to pour some of the stuff I've made right here into my titration solution cup. I'm going to pour some isopropyl alcohol into one cup. This will just be my waste. Okay. Then I'm going to need actually four cups. I'm sorry. This is where I'll actually do my titration. The basic recipe for a titration is 10 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol, one milliliter of oil, about two to three drops of phenolphthalein or phenol red or turmeric, or any kind of a pH indicator that will indicate on the pH scale. Remember, you go from 0 to about 14, 7 being neutral. This side is acid. This side is base. You want to be able to indicate. Uh -huh. Do you have any idea how much turmeric for a... Solution? Same amount. Just a couple toothpickfuls. Well, to make your solution, you mean? No, you never oh. use turmeric in your solution. Turmeric is your pH indicator. So, well, but you, okay, you've got phenolphthalein solution. Uh -huh. Don't you make a turmeric solution? You could, but people say it goes bad a lot really fast. Okay, so, it just, so keeps just, just put the powder in your 10 mm -hmm. ml. Okay. Yeah. If any of you have ever attended a girl mark class, she usually will do that. She'll, she brings turmeric around because it's, it's really easy to take on an airplane. <laughs> Taking anything with alcohol in it is kind of dangerous. So. <laughs> A pH indicator does nothing more than tell you where you're at on this scale. Phenol red, phenolphthalein, or turmeric happens to indicate right around here. Um, I don't know what turmeric is, but I know phenolphthalein is about 8.5. Phenol red, I think, is 8. It's, it's somewhere in this range. And all we're interested in is when we fully neutralize that acid, it's going to change to a base, and it's going to change color. And that'll tell us that we've made our volcano when we've fully neutralized our acid. Okay, so we're ready. That's all mixed up. Should be. Is this the good stuff to play with? Yeah. Well, okay. yeah. That's. Is that phenol? No, that's the one percent solution. Okay. The the reason that's purple <coughs> is I put two or three drops of phenol in it, so I know what it is. I tell at a glance because I have methanol, I've distilled water, I have KOH solution, etc. So I know the purple stuff is the 0.01. Does that make sense from an acid standpoint? So. This is a basic solution, so it's going to turn pink because we're up in this range. Okay, so to do a titration, we said we had two to three drops of phenol, some oil, and some isopropyl. The isopropyl is just acting as a solvent to put it together. Our next step is going to be to do the actual titration itself. 
and you're going to add measured amounts of this stuff, which is your titration solution, to this mixture. So I'm going to add all of this in here, and then drop by drop, I'm going to add some of this basic stuff in here until this turns pink. Or it's kind of a yellowish color if you use turmeric. It, it, it's basically until it indicates. And this is what it looks like when it indicates. Questions? Am I making sense? What's in that bottle again? I this the pink is throwing everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, what I did is this is this, and I threw some indicator in here. Oh, okay, so, so it's like swimming pool stuff at number two then. Huh? So like a swimming pool. Yeah. Just yeah. Pool a little no, it's over yeah. It's just the same stuff. Yeah. It's, oh, it's yeah. basically phenyl exactly phthalene, stuff. but it's the same stuff. It tells me what the pH is, and yeah. if the pH is above a certain level, yeah, it's no, going to yeah. change color. That's all I've done. So instead of adding the drops into your cup, it's already there. Is no. That what you're no. No. All that does is identify that to me so you get as being the indicator solution. <laughs> oh, I okay, use a lot of indicator solution. That is just for my own recognition. That's why Graydon's is clear, okay. and mine is purple. If just I, was, I just identified it that way. A couple okay. drops is all it takes to change it. If I was to add a couple drops of phenolphthalein into this... And we will before we're done, because we'll just pour that out anyway. Yeah, it'll turn a pink color. Okay. So it doesn't change It doesn't change the chemical makeup. No, chemical makeup no. Okay. In fact, it, it's kind of important to point out, I get people that call all the time and say, well, how much phenolphthalein should I add? How much titration, or how much of the phenol red? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Because it's not going to change how acidic or how basic <clears throat> the solution is. It's just an indicator. It's just there as a traffic cop to watch and see what happens. <laughs> to say, okay, we've got acid over here, we've got base over here. When do we hit the middle and when do we start moving? So if you want, you can pour a bunch in. You can pour a little bit in. It's just an indicator to tell you what's going on. As Two a, to three as drops. As a salesman in. selling it, I'd like to see you use a teaspoon. Whatever <laughs> <you want. laughs> if you want to use more of it, more power to you. Okay, let's do an actual titration. So I have two things of oil here. And one of them's good, and one of them's bad, and I don't know, and I don't know where they came from. We want to see how good it is. If any of you were in the previous... You basically got three. Oh, I got three there. If any of you went to the other one, they talked about a titration of three. What's that? Well, we're going to find out. Okay. So I'm going to add some titration solution. Pull some syringes out for me. Can you uh, pop some clear... Yeah, you bet. Let's move this out. Just so we're clear, what is the optimal pH for biofuel? Seven, when you're done? Seven. Okay, you want it neutral. Now, if after you've seen me do this, it confuses you and you don't want to do it, we also have these really cool packs that we sell called a Go No Go kit. We basically went in and said, okay, we set our titration here on a scale and if you put a milliliter of oil in this stuff, and if it doesn't change color, then it's that it's um, a titration of that or below. So, and we can customize them if you want. But these are kind of a cool little thing to build. I'll tell you how to build one too. It's pretty easy. What are those set at? Like five? I think these are set at five. Set at five. five. So it's a titration of five if you've done one. I got customers get them everywhere from three to twelve. So I'm going to add some titration solution. Now, I didn't dip a syringe in here and pull from it. That's important, okay? So there's my titration solution. No, no mount makes no difference. Mount doesn't make any difference in this cup because I'm going to draw from that cup into, the, into what I right do. Beside it. There we go. Oh, That's smart. I'm going to add a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Again, it doesn't really matter how much is in these because these aren't my measured amounts. Pull this forward. Not have any accidents here. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the syringe again? Uh, oh, okay. great. Okay. You want to use the pipette or you want to use the tape? No, I use the syringe. Okay. Okay. Here's your tent. Got that. Oops. Oops. Okay. So if you have 91% uh, isopropyl, would you add then 11 milliliters in your titration solution because you're 10% shy? No. no. The strength doesn't make any difference. You can use 70% or above. The isopropyl is just a solvent. 
Okay. It won't so throw. It, it, that exact amount is Right. And because they're using distilled water when they make this stuff, it doesn't have a pH. However, we're going to we are going to talk a little bit about that. There's something called blanking a titration. We'll talk yeah. a little bit about. So please, we will. Um, so I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in my titration cup, and then I'm going to take some measured amount or in my titration cup, and I'm going to take measured amounts of this and just put it in, and watch for it to turn color. And I want it to turn color and stay that color for 30 seconds or more. Because sometimes it can be neutralizing, neutralizing, and it'll come back a little bit acidic. So the other secret too is I always like to do three titrations because sometimes I can be off, and then I average the middle <coughs> of it. That, that'll get you good. That'll also let you know if you've been somewhat accurate with your stuff. Okay, oil, oil, oil. I have no idea what kind they are. This is just a syringe. I'm going to use 10 mils of isopropyl alcohol in one of these. the syringes that uh, don't lose their markings. You don't. And I'll tell you the secret. Go buy yourself some clear nail polish and paint them. That's the secret to the stuff not coming off. Okay, so that's 10. Should we blank it? Sure. Here's your phenol. Should take about three drops. Here you go. I think that's... No, I got gloves on. We're going to do something called blanking the titration. We, while we buy some stuff, we, it might have picked up a little bit of acidity. And all we want to know is. Well, I'm glad I don't use this stuff. <laughs> we just want to know. But it doesn't get smashed coming to you. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know if the pH is high or low on this stuff. If it's, a, if it's somewhat in the basic thing, we want to knock it back down. Okay. What we're going to do is put a couple drops of phenolphthalein in here. If it turns color, hey, we know something's up. You like phenolphthalein or phenol red? I like phenolphthalein because I'm a purist. If you talk to chemists, they like to use phenolphthalein. Phenol red works just as well. Turmeric works just as well too. Um, phenolphthalein, I, just the stuff I use. But there's, the, I mean, all they all indicate on the pH scale in the right around, right around the right area. You can actually walk into Walmart and buy everything you need to do a titration except your catalyst. You know, in Walmart. No, but turmeric is. Over in the spice section. Oh, yeah. so I think red is in the pool section. Pool, pool store, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you can't find it, I sell it. Be happy to. And we've got some out here we can sell you. I well, eat red where people say phenol red's not, not a good indicator. Oh, it works great. I, that's what I used to use when I first did it. So two or three drops in here. This didn't turn. And so you put a little bit of base in there, don't you? When you yeah. It. Uh, well, yeah, you could just go ahead and use your, your use pipette. Okay. So, how much? It usually takes three or four drops to, to, to turn. turn. Okay. To make it so what I'm doing is I'm just going to drop in measured amounts of this titration solution into here until it just turns and then it'll turn back. Okay? That tells me I've neutralized it and I'll hold this up. This should be pretty good alcohol. Yeah? Just it turned. And see how it's turning back? So does that say that that alcohol did pick up some? Okay. That alcohol's good. That alcohol's probably at seven. This one? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Y'all got to be washed anyway at this point. So I know it's good. So another 10. A lot of times you get this massive bubble. You just don't want the bubble in there. So I'm going to go way up past 10. I'm going to cheat. The bubble's sitting right on 10. I've got 10. So now I have a neutral alcohol solution. I'm sitting at seven right now, okay? I'm now going to add one milliliter of this mystery oil that we don't know what its titration is, or we don't know how acidic it is. 
So this is just like our volcano. This is our acid. This is the lemon juice, but we don't know how strong this lemon juice is. Okay. Use a clean syringe. You can clean syringes out too with isopropyl alcohol because it's a clean solution. Again, if you want to keep them clean, just I'm just sucking up one milliliter of oil. Also, I don't care who you are, this is messy. <laughs> and there's, I've never met anyone that can, you know, you need paper towels and stuff to do this. So I have one milliliter of my mystery oil, and it's going to go into here. Let's shake it up. Oil and alcohol don't like each other. In fact, if oil and vinegar, same basic principle. So you need to kind of mix this up. Uh, some people will also tell you you want to heat this up. Like if you're doing titrations out in your storage shed, like I did in the winter, I got a heat gun and I'll heat it up a little bit <laughs> to, to get that methanol so that it will dissolve this. Otherwise, you get these little globules of oil and they don't stick. Okay, right. so. What? You can get too hot because you can boil off the alcohol. So don't go too hot, but I mean, you just want a plastic warm. container. Yeah, I, I've, I'm Phoenix, guys. That's, <laughs> that's true. I know you're lucky down there. Yeah. And, and um, yes, I have melted one of the cups with my heat gun. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Okay, so now I have everything ready to do my titration. Now I'm going to start putting in measured amounts of this. We need to add a couple drops of phenolphthalein. Oh, I was hoping you were going to forget that. Nice no, guy. Such luck. Nice guy. Oh, we're friends. We're good That's friends. why we survive. <laughs> Sense of humor is okay, and I need a syringe that's clean because I've done both of no. these. Okay, no, five or ten. Mm, give me a ten. <sighs> this is good oil, though, isn't it? Well, well one know. of those is an eight. I don't know which one it is. Oh, now he ruined it for us. Told us the end of the story. But we don't know which one it is, though. We can all go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Again, clean. You want it clean because you don't want any acid or base in it. You want to start with a fresh one. So I'm going to draw. I like to draw about 10 milliliters into this thing because it's just easy math because then I just subtract. So off I go. Ooh, I got it without a bubble. I got lucky. Okay. So that everyone can see, I'm just going to start dropping stuff in. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but there's just slight things of purple coming on here. And a lot of times, it will go purple across the liquid that's dropping in, but it doesn't mean a thing. It's, you've got to get the whole thing purple and stay there for 30 seconds. Ooh, this is bad oil. <laughs> Not nearly as bad as mine. <laughs> there's some Whoa. of mine. Yeah. I used to love Arby's potato mm -hmm. cakes until I titrated their oil once. Same thing with chilies. I, <laughs> I quit at 22. Oh, you see the chilies? No, I 20, oil, 22. 22 KOH and still had not converted. I, I quit, but that was enough. And I thought my Chinese restaurant was bad at 14. Well, you're working on the second 10? Second yeah. 10. Yep. All right. Well, I did we get go. that off the bottom of that yeah. barrel, so yeah, we might have had. There we go. See, it's starting to turn a dark purple. Yeah, that is pretty bad oil. So we're going to talk about acid now? Acid esterification? Yes. <laughs> if you'd like, come and talk to me after or else I'll teach you a little bit about acid. Okay, so it took... So if you want to watch a clock here, we basically are watching until it turns and stays. This stuff should stay purple, and this is the purple we're looking for for about 30 seconds. What did it? Uh, what is that now? This is titration no, solution. But what, what were you at? I started at 10, so I'm at 17. 17. That's good. bad, isn't it? You told me to bring it some. Yeah, you did. Oh, that's perfect. That's what we wanted. Okay. <clears throat> if I was doing this in a normal per uh, place and I was going to make a lab, I would do this three times. Okay, but this has got 17. So I'm going to write <coughs> oil number one <sighs> took 17 milliliters. Okay, we'll do oil. Number two, oil, who we have, three or four? Three. Three. 
not going to make him do it again? <laughs> oh, I'll take that home and dump it all together and make buy yeah. a diesel out of it. This was the one we did? Yes. Yep. Okay. There's the first one. Another cup. Still these. Here, use the. Oh, cool. Use this the, is a use cool the new little. Toy. I hope we don't fill it. This is a cool little toy. It's what's called a Magster. It is the coolest little thing because you can do <laughs> tiny little titrations. We sell them on our website and we've been selling the heck.